Welcome everyone to the latest episode of the Curva Coaching Podcast. I'm joined today by two special guests, Alf Galusian, the co-founder of Curva Coaching, and a brand new guest today with us, Scott Wright, England and Wales Curva Coaching Director, a long-time Curva Coach and friend. Scott, welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me today in my hometown here in Coventry. It's a big week with the Youth Diploma too. Great to have yourself and Alf and Jake in town here in Coventry. And yeah, I'm looking forward to, to helping the coaches out there with some some tips and some advice. Yeah, absolutely. So today's podcast revolves around questions that you guys, coaches, mainly grassroots coaches, have posed to us on social media and sort of the common questions, frustrations, problems that you guys are all facing. So this this one's really dedicated to you guys. So I'm going to try and compare this as best as I can by bringing Scott and, and Alf into the conversation to, uh, to again, answer your questions uh, that you've posted. So the first one, guys, and I would say this is probably the most popular question that we've had, is around how do you manage um, parents? How do you uh, enable parents to contribute to the development of their children in football in the best way? And what would your uh, key tips be? Now, I'm going to bring you in, uh, Alf, in terms of your experience, and I know you've got some ideas around this. I've got, I've got kids and grandkids. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so how would you? Yeah. How would you? Um, what advice would you okay. give to, to coach? So, um, I, th- I think uh, if let's break it up into three parts, right? Um, so, before a game, uh, during a game, and after a game. Um, and so, before the game. Um, this might sort of sound strange, but uh, I, I was really heavily influenced by my friend, uh, Dr. Andrea Stoyan. You, you know him, Scotty. Um, he's a renowned cardiologist. And um, so what I'm going to say before the game is to do with actually preparing them physically. And Andrea was always talking about sleep, you know, that under 12 years old, I was staggered, you know, eight, nine, 10 hours sleep because they're playing so sort of the following days. So the parent can help. I, but the other thing he... he he kept uh, sort of saying to me, and I know now from my own grandkids, Jim, and and, and um, you know too, is screen time limit before the the game day limit the screen time. You know, the, so they stop their iPhones or if they're old enough or iPads before that. You know, like uh, it's seven o'clock. Uh, yeah, I think that that's an absolutely yeah. fantastic point. I coach an under eleven grassroots team. Okay. And one child that I'm thinking of in particular yeah. comes in every Saturday morning, yeah. almost like he's been out the whole night. Yes. And the issue is he's gaming till late with his elder yes. brother. Yes. And it has an effect. I think it has an effect on his behavior, on his attitude, yes. his stamina as well. And yes. his consistency. He's a good player, yes. but he can be very inconsistent. So I think that's an interesting point. Well, uh, I think that the science, and of course I'm not a scientist, but the uh, way Dr. Andre explained it to me was there's a blue light that affects the certain uh, chemicals in the brain. And so, uh, just simply though, let's get away from science, the parents puts a limit on screen time. Yes. Um, and then um, in the morning, um, so because it's a physical game and when they're 12, 13, 14, they're playing on a big pitch, right? I mean, you know, it's, it's uh, um, uh, a lot of sort of physical stamina is required. So a couple of bananas, um, a lot of water, you know. Um, so uh, pre-game, that f- that physical uh, sort of advice, the parent becomes like a coach for health, right? And then on the on the mental side, it's really encouragement. Uh, and again, um, you know, speaking to my other uh, doctor friend, Doctor Bain, um, so Pete was always saying, well, uh, the the kids actually looking to the parent for either negative or positive sort of signs and the coach right oh, and the coach but this is really to do with how the parent yeah, can yeah. be the coach or help the kid right and so the message you know driving to the game or before is you know have a good time and make sure you you know you enjoy your friends it's not about you must win or there's nothing to do with that and that sort of positivity it would be remember we're kind of talking about under 14 players here and so the parent can be very helpful before the game so now, during the game, um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll cut it short during the game, it's, is try not to speak. Now, yeah, um, except if it's encouragement. So don't engage uh, um, the referee. Don't engage your kid's teammates. Don't go up to your co- the coach of your teammate. And like a, I'm, I've been guilty of it, um, you know, and I've been, and I, I, I promise you I'm going to, 
I'm definitely going to stop it. Don't talk to the coach. You're not the coach. I'm a professional coach. I shouldn't be talking to my grandkids coaches, right? And so you know, try to discipline yourself. Um, and so uh, uh, the rest of the uh, advice during the game is that if you're going to say anything, it's well done, uh, good try. Uh, please don't comment on the referee. Uh, they ha it's already very difficult in grassroots football. Um, the lines of an issue is always an issue because, you know, one team, uh, one, one uh, person from one team uh, is lines on another team. And invariably, of course, uh, we're all human. They, they may be biased. Don't comment on that. Yeah. So at least they're volunteering. And then after the game, let's, uh, let, let me say, let's call it in the car. Talk about something else, not the game. Talk about what you, we're going to eat at lunchtime or um, what you're going to do in the afternoon. Or, uh, but don't talk about the game. In the car, no game talk. Yeah. Scott, what, your opinion on you know, the role that parents play in the development of the young player and any tips as a coach that, you know, to connect and get them on side in terms of your development uh, for that player? Yeah, I, I think it's all about education, Jim, to be honest. And I think often maybe the parents get left out of the process. They're sort of, yeah. you know, the, the taxi service, getting them there, sorting kits out, that mm -hmm. type of thing. And I think that, that including them in the process is really, really important. Yeah. So again, if we go to, to sort of game day, there's a few different, guess angles i'm going to take on this it's having different ways to evaluate success or failure of course the obvious one is did we win did we lose did we draw um but of course there's other ways to to, to sort of gauge development that's you know sort of for me the, the the match is an extension of training to practice all the things we've worked on in training so as an example with our partner clubs we have game targets so if we've worked on a three-week pressing block in training whatever the games are played during that cycle we also have, you know, team and you know, unit and individual targets. So it could be how many times within this period or half can we win the ball back in five seconds, as an example. So we could play really well and lose. We could play really badly and win. Uh, but we've also got this other way to gauge performance based on what we're working on in training. So I think that's really, really important. It's actually, for me, I would be looking at a game at the weekend as a, as a chance to practice what we've worked on in training against live opposition. Right. So, but again, you know, the coach might be thinking this, but they don't maybe articulate it or explain it mm. to the parents. So I think having this, this clear plan of this, this is why we're, we're working in a certain way on, on, on the game based on what we've worked on in training is really important. And then maybe that changes the conversation in the car afterwards. Maybe that changes the behavior on the sideline yeah. is actually, we, you know, we, we could be four nil down or four, three down or whatever it is, but actually we've, we've done uh, really well in winning the ball back which yeah. actually from that particular game, because that's what we're working on in training, that's our target. So we'll, we'll win or lose, but we, we're trying to bring to life what we're working on in training. Scotty, can I ask you, you know, you've got a lot of experience with uh, Kerber Partner yeah, Clubs yeah, yeah. and what you've just said now. What, what's been the reaction of the clubs and the parents? Yeah, I think that, that having that, that sort of 360 support and plan is, is right. of course, I think it's been a godsend, to be honest, to, to many clubs. Right. So from the the full season technical curriculum that we provide to the coaches, right. to the to the home practice programs for the players, you know, to having this sort of, you know, th there's a there's a plan we're working on. You know, the Kerber box trap is, is is the is the foundation of our of our partner club program. So you're actually working towards playing a certain way. But of course, to play a certain way, the players need a, a certain skill set and mindset. I just think generally having having a plan out. Um, you know, I think the reality of grassroots football is 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 made up of volunteers that have jobs that are busy, um, and often what will happen it will be you know maybe just the same things are being worked on. Maybe we're grabbing something off the internet an hour before training, whereas actually what we're providing through our partner club program is a structured full season, multiple season plan. So you've done this for many years. Yeah. So you work with the partner clubs, right? Yeah. Um, and generally, I know this is a general question, yeah. but would you say that positive? It's always been a positive feedback. Yeah, I, I think I think it's it sort of it's again going back to to education. So again, if you're going from where there's no plan and no communication, mm -hmm. and maybe co coaches doing their best, the parents are just doing what they think is best, and mm -hmm. I don't think with all intentions purposes, 
you, you know, nobody goes out there with with, with an intent or, or what have you. It, it's just situational. Maybe people are just doing what was done to them when they were kids. You know, knowledge is power at the end of the day. And um, so, yeah, like I, I think that having that, I guess, crossing that bridge from nothing to to, to sort of an extensive plan. There's good, there's always going to be, you know, like a, a transitional period. Uh, but I think that the clubs that have been with us for, you know, for a period of time that have then seen those eight-year-olds progress into 12-year-olds, right. so foundation phase into the youth phase, they've got a good feel for the ball, they're more confident uh, and therefore more able to um, get whatever we would call success in the game. Um, I think that it's it's got to be um, beneficial to the clubs, but it, I guess you've got to get the buy-in from everyone. I think that's the big thing. Well, uh, also too, I mean, we're talking about grassroots, right? Which, which I, I don't know a lot about. Mm. Um, so, but, but grassroots football, they're mostly volunteers. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, they probably haven't got their coaching licenses. Yeah. You know, if you say uh, maybe, or, or maybe, maybe, one, or, yeah. uh, maybe level one, but certainly CBA, yeah. uh, that, that, that'd be the pro clubs. Yeah. Um, so I, I do think that what we're providing the partner club uh, uh, offer, if you like, yeah. is that expertise, yeah. right? Because we, we, we had so many years in this. Yeah. Right? It's yeah. a fast track process and it's yeah. providing resources that, you know, no matter what level, you know, you, you're at in your education development, yeah. you, sh- you should very simply be able to bring that. If you just follow that plan, Right. The sort of learning should take af- uh, look after itself because of the yeah. because of the practice. But design. it's the support. Really, right? I think it is, and yeah, yeah. what's also been yeah. been good for us is we have WhatsApp for for each of the clubs, so yeah. we've got sort of, yeah. let's say twenty seven twenty four seven support. We're always there to to help through the process. Which of course, you know, if you go and do the national qualification, let's say level one, you'll be there for a few days, and, and that's that. Yeah. So who, who, who do you reach out to when when you've maybe had a tough session on Tuesday night? By the way, I am on one of the, a couple of but where my my one of my grandsons WhatsApp and yeah, which yeah. is a partner yeah, club yeah, a club yeah, yeah, yeah. that you do yeah and the incredible message the the passion from the parents yeah yeah I mean every two seconds I look at my phone because I get calls from you know all over the world yeah, yeah. I'm looking at WhatsApp this and yeah. you know Johnny's doing this and Jesse's yeah. doing this and it's fantastic. I think that 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 of course I'm a dinosaur regarding uh, technology, but that 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 uh, being involved at WhatsApp yeah. uh, group, yeah, is yeah. really you feel part of the team. Yeah, it's really yeah. crucial. Yeah, I think going back to what we're, we're saying, it's yeah. it's you know there's there's multiple people involved in this mm-hmm. process. You've got the club, you've got the coach, mm-hmm. you've got the parents, you've got the players, and then we sort of underpin you know everything. And it's about mm-hmm. joining it all up, yeah. Um, and making everybody feel part of it because again when you look at home practice you know one of the common questions you know about working with the ball you know generally kids in england train one time a week for 60 minutes mm-hmm. it's not really 60 minutes because you could have a book in it a five side center now we're coming into the winter months it's 50 minutes mm-hmm. so what do you do in that 50 minutes yeah um so actually then that time at home becomes important yeah, and yeah. we're also providing you know a home program yeah. that is virtual teacher yeah. um which is literally plug, plug and play. So we're, we're helping at home, we're helping in training, you know, we're, we're giving little piece of advice around game day. So I, I guess really it's just providing a, you know, a structure and a, and a plan and support, ongoing support. Again, it's not, you know, here you go, good luck, and we'll see you at the end of the season. It's this ongoing support. And of course, the other key thing to this is then the education of the, the Curva method. So we provide a bursary for our Curva virtual intro course and our Youth Diploma One course. So actually, you know, for, for 100 places uh, on each of those courses. And the idea is to get parents on it. The idea is to get older players onto it. You know, these could, this, is, this is the workforce of the future or currently mm-hmm. now. So actually, if we've got, through education, if we've got everybody thinking in the same way and understanding why we're doing what we're doing, going back to the original question, I, I think that that really helps with the question is how, how do we sort of, guess, deal with the parents? You include them in the process. Um but it's got to make sense. It's got to make sense, Scott. And I think, interestingly, you know, coming from now, if I've got my partner club uh, hat yeah, yeah. as a, a coach at Grassroots yeah. Club, I think evidence is also something that parents obviously can see. Yeah. And if they see progress, they see improvement, that just helps build this kind of support for yeah. what you're trying to do. Yeah. And, and I, I would also say, I think you probably got a relatively short period of time at the beginning to get yeah. them on site. Oh, yeah. And then you can see that kind of snowball of support which really gets everyone pointing in the same direction, which again, yeah. they helps that. that it, it's that key, approach. isn't it? And, and it's like anything, you know, these people having, they're, 
they've just been put together just yeah. because their kid plays at that particular club. They might not necessarily inter- interact without that football uh, environment. So actually, you know, getting getting a whole group of people on site, getting everyone on site is probably impossible. Actually, yes. uh, yeah, but, 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 but actually, it's, it's, it's about the majority. Right right yeah, it's it's about the right. majority, and it's and, it, and it's about educating. You know, it's about educating people, and like you said, once they see the difference with their child. So again, look, if you're doing your home practice, you're going to be more comfortable on the ball. You're going to start doing things in the game that they couldn't do before, and other parents will notice that. And actually, oh, we sort of get it. You know, you know, you're going to have these penny penny drop moments uh, during the games too, Scott. You'll see the contrast between how we want to play yeah. as a kind of partner club yeah, yeah. versus how maybe another good side that has a different approach. Yeah. I think now. Everyone's so uh, up on the Premier League, obviously, and all the great teams and players. Yeah. That brand of football is attractive, attractive to parents, attractive to fans, etc. When they can see their grassroots team try and play yeah. in that way and have little, so little flashes, success. little little, little yeah. moments. Yeah, yeah. 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 that's what it's about. Yeah, so so that's a, that was a, another interesting question that sometimes I ask: the power of the internet and TV, which certainly in my era that was not, uh, it wasn't available. So um, everybody's watching football and. The coaches of grassroots clubs uh, sort of kind of mimicking. I mean, a, a great example is playing from the back. It's probably the most, uh, you know, the podcasts or interviews I do. One of the, the biggest, uh, the most asked questions. And what they what's happening is they're seeing the a Premier League or Match of the Day or whatever that program is, and they're seeing uh, that as a feature. It's really become probably. And I've got four grandkids, and I go and watch them whenever I can. And from six to thirteen, and every one of the teams that they play for, play games, play play from the back. So it's it's not only a buzzword; it, it's here, and I think it's here to say it stay. And um, you know, I I, I think uh, um, it's a difficult one because you know it's dangerous, and you know if people, uh, you know, football's a competitive game. The object is to win the game. Um, losing is painful, uh, absolutely. Um, but here we've got a topic that could be risky, that could result in losing the game. And because we're talking about involving parents and parents' education, so whatever, however we communicate with the parents or our partner club coaches, we've got to make sense of why it's a sensible way to play on a Saturday or Sunday or Wednesday, whenever the clubs play. I think so. This, this, this is something that in Kerber we we're trying to address within our drilled DNA, within our session planning, um, and um, I, I think we've got a good approach on it. And, uh, and, and so let, let's talk about that topic, play, playing out from the back. And actually, uh, Brandon on Facebook um, uh, sent us a message about this and asked, mm-hmm. particularly involving the goalkeeper, what sort of qualities, technical qualities, the goalkeepers now need to play. When you're playing out from the back, I mean, you know, they're involved, constantly involved now doing that. Scott, I'll, I'll throw it over to you now. Just just take us through maybe a little bit about how goalies used to be and now what the modern requirements are, even at the Yeah, grassroots. Well, having been a goalkeeper myself, I'm probably quite a, mm. quite a good uh, candidate to answer this question. So I think back to, I probably never had any proper goalkeeper coaching, probably till I was 15, let's say. So I guess how I learned to, to be a goalkeeper was down the park in goal, probably against older kids and literally just having hundreds of shots smashed up. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I guess you find a, a, a skill for, for, you know, for, for, for stopping, the ball it. Yeah. And stopping yeah. it. Yeah. Um, I guess the difference now is that the goalkeeper, especially at the top level is, is really an outfield player now. Um, so the use of the, the feet is, is crucial. Um, again, especially with this, this trend in build up from the back, starting attacks from the back. If you look at, Someone like Edison, who we fo- uh, featured on the East of Player 2 course, um, I'm sure if called upon, he could probably play in central midfield or, or centre back. Oh, he was, he was an outfield player yeah, until he was and 12, he played foot. So, yeah, 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 obviously, yeah, yeah, yeah. talked last night about mm. when we took the group of players to, to Bayern when uh, mm. when Pat was manager. Uh, we went to watch first team training afterwards, uh, after the match, and Neuer played the whole session in, in central midfield. He, he didn't have his, his gloves on once. Um, and again, if you're looking, I guess going back to the original question, and I had this um, when I was at Stoke, obviously Stoke with, with our original Curver Partner Club, we did a five-year project. And one of the key things there was was having the, having the goalkeepers take part in the additional Curver sessions. So outside of the, 
the standard academy sessions, which half of everyone uh, were cover based anyway, there was additional technical sessions around ball mastery, uh, which all the goalkeepers, um, you know, had had, had to attend yeah, to yeah, to, oh, to yeah. work on their, you know, to yeah. work on their footwork. Yeah. Yeah. But but at the same time, it's you know, it's not to say that you know, if you're a you're a team coach. You know, just sticking the goalkeeper in and smashing footballs at them is probably not the best idea either. Um, which, which happens, you see it. You know, this is, again, it goes back to back to knowledge, doesn't it? So it's actually just looking at how you can integrate the goalkeeper into your practices. So if you're working on possession as an example, it's a perfect opportunity for the goalkeeper to play on the outside. Um, you know, to sort of link the play up, they're working on their body shape, they're switching from left to right. So this could be the left back playing into the keeper, playing back out to the to the right back so actually have them in those possession games as an example on the outside you know when you're working on on your ball mastery can you work, be working on hand mastery can like players be passing into them so they're working on their footwork and their handling and you know, so there's, there's, I think that's that's really really important so I just know from from my experience of when I was a kid goalkeeper training was, was literally right you, you're getting gold and everybody smashed balls yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and I guess it I guess it's sink or swim but actually you know, now um, I guess one of the biggest things as well, which, which was which was interesting, I remember at Birmingham when I uh, when when I worked there, we had a, a long relationship in the academy, and Jack Butland was actually an, an outfield player um, that was turned into a goalkeeper. Um, so if you look at someone uh, someone like him who actually had fantastic distribution up to a certain age, now maybe they're not going to make it as an outfield player, but could be a goalkeeper. Mm. So actually, be careful how we pigeonhole players as well in those younger age groups just never know so actually you know, some of those outfield players could be really good goalkeepers you just don't know so so why not rotate them around when, when we're playing games and, and in training and we, we just don't know we, we simply don't know of course as they develop and they mature size comes into it when we're talking about that position but, but yeah I think I think now going back to what we're talking about um you know ball mastery is is as important to the goalkeepers as hand mastery, if you call it like uh, call it that, and that's definitely something that I think both of us have seen. Certainly in the professional clubs, of course, you know what generally happens. This will will sort of filter down into to grassroots. But again, you know, if you're coaching your your group of sixteen or twenty kids on your own, you, you're probably going to focus on the outfield players because the majority will rule. But I think there's some really simple ways you can integrate the goalkeeper. And again, from a a long in point of view from a from a team building point of view, it's really, really important that all of the players in all positions feel part of the team. It. I think I think so. They've got goalkeepers a really unique position, isn't it? Um really, really unique. I think you get you know, you get remembered for your last mistake rather than your last save, you know. Um but, but, yeah. but also if you uh, say you've got a goalkeeper that can pass and receive yeah. and the other team don't. Yeah. You're a man up. Yeah, yeah. So you know, uh, it's uh, um you know, it's it's sensible, you know, you you can make that case to the coach, right? And mm -hmm. and um, but to, to to Scott's point about the pro uh, the in the pro game, um, I mean, if you told me twenty years ago the goalkeeper would be passing in in the pro game, I would have said, "Come on, no, you're passing one v one in the box." Well, so that, they, uh, uh, that, they get out of trouble, right? With one v one moves. That, um, well. Yeah, that I wouldn't advise. <laughs> um, but, but 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 basically, the goal the wood. So. What the goalkeeper now, and this is where Kerber's really, like Scotty says, has in the, in the pro game, because that's one I know a bit more than the grassroots game, is that um, I remember the first, uh, when Gerald Hulia, my dear late friend, was uh, Olympic uh, Olympic Leon. And um, so I used to go and uh, from time to time, mentor, you know, coach the education programs for the coaches. And what Gerald did was take the regional, uh, I can't remember, I think it was New Era, so 97, when uh, the new era of the video series, or or one one of them that had several ball mastery moves, and he gave it to the goalkeeper coach, and this was the first team goalkeeper of Olympic Leon, and um, so in in pro you know you've got the goalkeeper and you've got a goalkeeper coach and assistant goalkeeper coach, you don't have the batting grassroots like you know Scotty was saying, so it was very interesting that um, the pros immediately understood that they would have that man advantage, but they couldn't have it unless the goal seemed possible. And like Scotty says, when he was a young goalkeeper, nobody really told him that, you know, you've got to receive him possible. He didn't use your feet. I mean, like, yeah, you, you just no, used, I didn't see that. Like, right. You but it, there was also no curriculum like Kerber, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, I don't want to date you, but yeah, there, yeah. Was, there was certainly in my day. That was so, 
there's no curriculum. And now there's a curriculum. So playing from the back, what do you need? You need the curve ball mastery curriculum. You need the boys and girls, uh, you know, up to 14 years old. Sorry, is this applicable to defenders as well? Oh, I, absolutely. Every yeah. every single player, yeah. right? So the, in, in Kerber, we believe that the foundation of the game is ball mastery. Once you've got ball mastery, your passing becomes better, your receiving becomes better, your 1v1 becomes better, um, you know, your, your shooting becomes better. So the mother and father of the game skills is ball mastery. So over 40 years, we've built this huge library. So um, when Scotty goes and signs a partner club, not only... Uh, does he do that on the curve of reputation and his personal uh, skills of, of, of teaching and advising, but he does it on a body of work, proven work, that's been built up over 40 years. And and I can't say any of our competitors come near with the volume of work and the, the years of, that we've spent on this topic for mastery. So playing from the back, yes, every player, including the goalkeeper, um, in grassroots, they're only practicing once or twice a week, so it's really not enough. So um, like Scotty says, uh, with the partner clubs, they get homework. Um, I know that we've got a very nice program. I think it's called Players Club, Jim. And, and uh, um, you know, it's a lot of little tests that kids can do at home. But anything they can do at home. So when you're talking about playing from the back and preparing to play from the back, ball mastery has got a feature, else ball mastery exercise. The second is, and, you know, I'm obsessed with trying. Uh, we, we did a Diploma 2 course yeah. yesterday, and I think people think I'm a little crazy, well, which I am probably, but but the, the, I'm obsessed with triangles right now. And for young kids, certainly under 12, when they play for the back, what, what, once you're going to receive, I mean, what, the, the, let me add one thing, receiving and, and, and passing, playing from the back, the goalkeeper and defenders, don't do one touch. I mean, it's a disaster, right? So... One of the things I'd advise is it's a two-touch play. Uh, and so uh, now that's dangerous. Goalkeeper receives it, touches it, somebody presses it, him or her. Dangerous. So there's something in Kerber we've got called touch direction. It's where you actually play. Because if you play in space, you can't be pressed. If you play in the wrong place, there's no space, you can be pressed. So if that's the only requisite, I would say, that when a coach is working with the goalkeeper and defenders, is playing from the back is two-touch. Your first touch is into space, never towards anybody that's pressing, right? Once that happens, the second thing is form a triangle. So imagine the goalkeeper is on the base of the triangle and your midfield player is a tip of the triangle and your two wide players. And th that triangle has four different sort of uh, variations. You move to the right, uh, so the right player gets it. The goalkeeper moves, the, the player on the left moves inside the midfield player comes in or the middle player comes in a bit. Then the opposite way, that's number two. And then the third way is the middle player comes in and squashes the triangle. Um, so, um, in fact, rather than four, let me, let me just be more simple, uh, say three. You learn those three ways, that those, those patterns, and they're all triangles. And I think, and, and remember the two-touch play, the, the, the touch in two, never one touch. You've got a chance of being successful. I, so I think we talked, um, that was a good explanation and some mm -hmm. ideas around playing out from the bat mm -hmm. and the technical qualities required from defenders and attackers. Mm -hmm. um, uh, let's take it to the younger age group now. We've got quite a few questions posted on Facebook from coaches of U8 players. And our, the first one is an absolute classic. I saw it with my, my own kids as well. Um, come game day, every player is basically playing by themselves. Everyone's following the ball and every player on the pitch is in with within a five yard sort of circumference. How do you, at that young age group, how do you encourage players, Scott, to spread out and to pass the ball? I think this is something that is going to improve by practice. And I think that it's a trait of young players because they want to be on the ball. Um, I think those age groups as well, they don't necessarily like sharing the ball either, um, which if we want to develop skillful 1v1 players or dribblers is a good trait to have but of course as they develop the decision making of do I go alone do I com combine has to come into it um I think there's there's lots of little games you can play in in training to encourage you know using the pitch effectively um but I think within that looking into gameplay going back to to what I said sort of earlier on um I think it's just having those little um, I guess buzzwords and situations. So, what, one of the things I would be saying to the players is when we 
win the ball, we need to explode and make the pitch big as possible. When we lose it, we make the pitch small. So you almost have these very small little um, or simple ways to understand about using the pitch. Um, but again, I just think this is a this is an ongoing process um, that's just going to take time. It's going to take them playing lots of games, lots of little games in training. You know, having these little strategies. Um, but I guess again, it, it, it's it's something that, that is going to happen a lot, uh, and you're going to have to be patient. Patience uh, is king. I, I think so, I and mean, I think that again, going back to the to the environment, everyone needs to be patient. The parents, the players, the coach, um, because I guess it can be be frustrating. Because again, sometimes you might see something in training, and then it doesn't translate to the game. Um, that's going to happen. That's just the just just a fact. So I guess it's seeing the long game and just making those little adjustments and. You know, maybe what happened at the weekend, we spend a little bit of time in a training session working on that. Whatever that may be, that's one of the problems that you might, might come up against. So, so yeah, I think there's there's not a necessary simple answer. I think it's time and just having that, you know, we're working with, with really young kids. So it's a really bite-sized, step-by-step yeah. approach over a period of time. i tell you what helps uh, with my daughter's steam, Scott. So that's under nine, five aside. Yeah. Just the, the diamond shape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just like a bit of a trigger word. Yeah. Guys, diamond. Yeah, yeah. And they, they kind of get there. Yeah, and why, so. they, then you might change the shape. Well, as Alf said, I mean, triangles. I mean, a diamond is two triangles, isn't yeah. it? So actually one, one links into the other. And again, this is, you know, this is something that, that really, you know, needs to be part of every training session, really. If it's, if it's going to become habit in the game and not only habit for them to be confident to, to do things in the game it's going to take lots of repetition that reinforce then it goes back to the coach's knowledge yeah because um i'm sure you found that but I mean, in, in other countries mm-hmm. than england um uh, i think it is a global uh, situation that most grassroots coaches are volunteers or they're pet like you jim you know you're fit and n- nearly a- again I, scott knows the grassroots game 100 times better than me but but what i've seen from the grassroots game is that it's mainly parents who volunteer who, um, w- when you're talking about you know following the ball and, and uh, you know in the diploma two, I was describing it as a positional indiscipline, um, and um, so um, you know I'm I, I, I'm a big fan of Cruyff and and total football, and you could say that was positional indiscipline, but they had this thing called rotation, so that if if the forward wanted to go back and get the ball from the goalkeeper. The, the left fullback at that in those days would then replace that forward. So, but there was an understanding. Little kids don't understand. Like Scotty said, they follow the ball. And then you've got the parent who is a volunteer coach, and they get frustrated, and they're constantly commentating. I mean, that's uh, we 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 we're moving a little bit away. I don't know. If, uh, this is just my experience watching my four grandkids. The amount of commentating that goes on in the game. So coaches don't speak. I mean, please don't speak unless. So the, the, uh, this idea that if you speak a lot, you're teaching. You're not. If if you speak less, you're teaching because they they learn by doing, right? Which means don't speak. So I think it can also have potential to confuse kids, especially if they're getting mixed communication. So the parents are saying throw it back. Yeah, exactly. Like, okay. The coach actually wants it yeah, throw yeah. back and play yeah, the other. Exactly. Way. Exactly. And, exactly. And you see sometimes at my grassroots level, you yeah. see kids confused by mixed messages as well. Yeah. But. Um, Say uh, at, at, say under seven, under eight, Jim. Well, one thing that I found, I saw another coach do it, and I thought, oh, it's a good idea. He sort of like had a, they were playing 4v4, I think, or 5v5, and he divided the field into quarters, and so the red is against yellows. And he said, right, only two yellows in the left box, only one red at the, yeah. in the, in the uh, uh, right box. And because there were two colors, it's quite easy. These are, these were like six or seven year olds. I'm telling you, I was astonished. They did it. I think yeah. the multi goal yeah. games are really yeah. effective as well. I mean, I think yeah. that, that when you look at the standard game in England where you've got two goals on the same line, it, it doesn't you know, really help the situation with young players. If you look at, um, from what I was reading, what, what Germany have just done, there's been a, another bit of a revolution in what they're doing. They're actually introducing multi goal games to, in, in the league. Just to be in the league. Oh, yeah. 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 So, yeah. so the idea that you have, you know, four goals or six goals and you could be attacking three of them, six mm. of them, whatever it is. I think naturally, you know, this is a common thing that we do within our curve of session. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah. hey, it's not necessarily mm. the, 
what you would call the real game here. But remember, this is a step by step approach. Yeah. And it's certainly not endorsed by UEFA. I yeah, mean, yeah. Germany way. I mean, all credit to them. You yeah. know, they went against because for you know football's really yeah. politi political, right? And 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 these organisations, FIFA and UEFA, don't like change. Yeah. But I mean, basically, don't like change. So the point you raise is a really good one because if your Saturday or Sunday grassroots match is you're playing with four goals, then immediately you're teaching decision making. Yeah, yeah. You're right, sorry, teach, improving decision yeah. making. You're improving scanning. In other words, look yeah. up because as you've got uh, two more, goals, more forward yeah, passes, more, forward. You know, and and yeah. then go to to what the point that you raised earlier. You're actually, and I'm sure with the curve apart, yeah, you're, right. you're, you're doing this. Yeah, you're actually using match day as an extension of training. Yeah, that, that's the one. That, yeah. So, yeah, for me, that's almost like yeah. uh, that's the tricky bit, isn't it? Whereas actually, in training, we can do whatever we believe, that right? We think is best, but then we're, I guess structured in the way at the weekends where maybe in those younger age groups it's not actually helping what we're talking about it's actually the opposite so you know we kind of get into like facilities and things like that but i mean that would be quite a simple fix for the problem if actually multi-goal games were, were allowed mm. you know and it doesn't have to be every week um but again you'd have to get the buy-in from everyone yeah, i think for yeah, you know yeah, because you could yeah, have just yeah. one one club or one coach that maybe doesn't agree with it and they want to play the traditional way was actually what really needs to happen is the federation needs yeah. to say this yeah. is what we're doing these are the laws for these age groups and this is why we're doing it and like i don't think you can really argue there's a lot of sense in it for the yeah. problem yeah. that we're talking about multi-goal games will yeah. help with using yeah. using the pitch right like, it will encourage more creativity yeah. more decision making yeah. more forward passes yeah. more success ultimately yeah. an enjoyment for the kids and isn't it crazy that the yeah. political considerations yeah, yeah, of people yeah. People who are not even playing the game, yeah. they decide, and then coaches like Scott, who's working every week, every week, seeing everything, has got a good idea, but can't put that idea forward to a league because the league is dominated by people who don't want change. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, you know, I mean, there's no answer to that. Um, but certainly, um, as, as he does with his partner clubs, to encourage multi-goal games, which yeah. I know you do yeah, yeah. with your partner clubs. Um, is a fantastic idea yeah. because it has incredible benefits, especially for young players. And again, like one of the considerations potentially is equipment as well, because obviously multi goals. If you're doing it, mm. then there's maybe mm. a financial element to that. But again, in training, you can you can use cones as goals. Of course, mm. mini goals are, mm. are what you want. Um, so there's no reason why you can't do it. But, but again, like these are factors that that can probably be be asked. Okay, I, let me ask you a question. Um, Yes, you're right because balls, uh, you know, equipment, yeah, it yeah. costs money, right? Yeah. But as the parents are already volunteering, you know, they're driving their kids mm -hmm. and they're paying for their kids and they're paying for equipment and mem membership. Have you found in your experience with your partner clubs that parents are willing to say, let's say you want eight more goals, mm -hmm. they're willing to say, yes, I understand, you've made a good case. Yeah, like I, uh, I, I think uh, this this then all comes back to to a guess the how the club set up, and and again, if this was something that was brought in from a federation point of view, that would have to. I, I forget about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But, 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 how would do you feel that if you made that case to your partner club and you said, "Look, we don't need, we need twelve goals." Yeah, we, we we've seen this in the partner club exactly. program. Exactly. We, well, we, you know, like we, you know, that the, that element is fundamental mm -hmm. to, to our sessions. Um, you know, and again, goal, you know, equipment be shared as well, can't it? Yes. If you, go, if you go back to the game days, depending on how they're set up, you know, it's like half the teams are away, half are at home. Maybe that equipment can be. Can, can you explain the, the 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 curve of goal? Can you just, just a brief? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we 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 have some some different um, target goals that that we use. So yeah, these are just smaller goals that are portable that um, self weighted. And can you can fold them up and carry them? Yeah, you could. Oh. They can be they can be folded up. They right. can be um, you know transported if, if necessary. And they're safe. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. safe. Yeah. And um, and I just think adds a real different dimension to, to training so mm -hmm. so again it could be that you know if funds are tight then maybe two age groups can share them and you do one session you know one session on one session off this is the reality isn't it mm -hmm. um, but i think dialing back to, to the original point that we're talking about providing the optimum environment for all of the players to fulfill their potential then that little change mm -hmm. in structure has a massive, massive mm. impact mm. On, on, all, on, all, on all the key things in the game, like you said, mm. scanning, decision making, mm. creativity. Mm. It's going to be obviously well, the same mm. questions. Exactly. You can have all that. And I think Jim 
don't we, I mean, globally, I'm talking globally now, don't we have our own Kerber mini golf? Uh, yes, we have yeah. various uh, right. uh, providers that we work with. Right. America and Europe, right. different, different ones. But right. no, they're, they're definitely, but like Scott said, if if the finance part is in play, yeah. then maybe comes, there's another. But I think you've got to make there. a case for that finance, haven't you? Yes. So, so he's made a case, yeah. Sam, I'm, I'm, as a grand, he's made, He's made a case to me that and say we need twelve goals, and he's made a case. Well, because it's going to improve scanning, decision making, uh, your creativity. Okay, but yeah. that my grandson's definitely going to get this. Yeah, I, I think yeah. they would have yeah. understanding yeah. of the support. Yeah. Also, I think if you look at you know some of the challenges around substitutes and things on game day. So let's just say hmm. I don't believe we have got a question on that. Yeah. We do Pre preemptive. Uh, yeah, no, Scott, a very topical. I was actually <laughs> going to go over to that. Okay, yeah. Um, so the question, and uh, let me get the gentleman today. Uh, uh, Robert. Yeah. Robert on Facebook asks, "I've got 15 players on the weekend. Yeah. How do I keep my subs yeah. game? Is it 11 v 11? 11 v 11. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you yeah 11 v 11. Mm -hmm. U 12 coach. Yeah. How do I? Sorry, his name's Brian. How do I uh, keep those subs engaged, so, involved, yeah. and also the parents on side as well? Yeah. Parents want their kids. To so there's a, a couple of if I can sort of yeah, yeah you know more than about this. this one up. Yeah, yeah. There's a couple yeah. of things I would do personally um, is going back to to sort of this mini goal, mini pitch idea. If, if space allows it, you know, often matches are played in in parks and big recreational, um, I guess, spaces in England. Let's say. If if there was a bit of space to the touchline, I would have another pitch set up, a mini pitch. So either my substitutes would be playing against each other on this mm -hmm. mini pitch. So actually, everybody's going to get equal game time. Um, that's something that, that I would be believing in in those younger age groups. Is that what you advise current clubs? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 so, this, so this would be something. That, and again, this is where, where maybe, you know, what happens in training and... and ideology um, gets lost when it gets a game day because the winning mentality comes in. So again, we've got to think about the long game. Um, but yeah, I mean, what I would do, uh, two two things I would do to, to keep them engaged and involved would be having this extra pitch set up on the side. So again, that could be your substitutes against each other, but it could be the substitutes against the substitutes. Mm. Like a pickup game mm. down the park, like mm. street football doesn't happen. Against the opposition, yeah, that's true. Yeah. You get yeah. an agreement with the with the coach. I don't think it's something that you say. This is what I would do. Mm. Um, I haven't seen that. Of, of, of course, this would have to be managed because it would be competitive, but that, that sort of getting a street football vibe, a pickup game, that's what I used to do when I was a kid. I'm sure you did as well. Um, so to everybody for that whole, you know, period of time they've committed, you know, you could travel an hour to a game, an hour to get back, but you played like 20 minutes. It's like, come on, this is a one game a week, potentially. Some kids play more. I would have that game going on at the side and then literally you come out of that game and you go into that. Oh, great idea. So we've got big game, small game. So, so again, that's a way to get your multi-goal point across sure. if, the, you know, it's not allowed in the main game. Um, if the other coach doesn't want to do it, you just do it yourself. If they do do it, then you mix them up or you can have your own games, whatever it is. The other thing I would say as well, dialing back to the game targets. So uh, I mentioned earlier on, we provide game targets based on the topics that we're working on. So if I take pressing, which is the first three-week block in our um, partner club program. So if the challenge, and I'd agree this with the kids, is to win the ball back 10 times within five seconds, I would actually have the subs doing the tallies, get them observing and watching the game and feeding man to their teammates. That's a good idea. Off. Good idea. And actually, when you come on, they're going to do the same for you. So what you start to develop is maybe a more an analytic mind in the kids to actually look at the game. You, you know, I, I guess when they're just there as subs and they're not being engaged, they're, they're just there as subs and they're not being engaged. That's, a, you know, between the two, the activity with the game, but also getting them analysing the game, I think it's really crucial. And, and it's very easy as well. That's it's always been a... a, a standout feature of the kids yeah. how they interpret and analyse the games yeah. so where maybe your commentary you're watching a pro game and, and they the commentator says oh he's just done a lollipop or a step yeah. over well, if you ask the curve kid they'll tell you exactly what that guy's just yeah. done I think that's an extension of what you're making school yeah. where young people are actually having a more analytical approach a better understanding mm -hmm. and a better kind of communication of that well, and that's part of the benefit. Like, that's almost yeah. the way to frame it, isn't it? It's almost like our little version of MS. Yeah. You know, yeah. Car Carragher and Neville, you guys are analysing the game. We're going to come up with our yeah. own statistics. This, yeah. this is what we've worked on in training. You know? Yeah. And so for, for your partner clubs, would, would you advise your partner clubs, grassroots clubs, yeah, yeah. 
um, to, uh, we, and this is do with substitutes, have equal time regardless of the ability of the player? I, th I think, look, it, I think that, you know, from a, from a, a perfect world point of view, that's absolutely what should happen. You know, every does it? Does it happen? I, I, no, I, I, I think we would be kidding ourselves if we said okay. yes. Um, I think naturally, you know, a lot of coaches will, 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 will try to to win the game mm -hmm. ultimately, mm -hmm. um, and and you know, like we keep saying that actually, unless we give everybody, like kids develop in different ages and stages, right. so who, who might not be at the top of the group now, could be in three months' time or right. six months' time. How do we know? Right. Um, you know, some more obvious than others, but if we're talking about again going back to like under sevens and under eights and so on. Um, surely that has to be be the the approach. But, yeah, I, I think to Brian's question, he's got fifteen players. Yeah. Um, I think it, I think it's almost, you know, it, uh, uh, not uh, sensible, but I think it is really should be giving players equal time. Yeah, I mean, I've heard, I've you know, so, they, yeah. they turn up, and and then it goes back to that first question: of parents, how do you say to a parent? You know, they they're not they, they see what's happening. My kids played three minutes. Yeah. The other kids played eight, uh, seventeen minutes. Yeah. I mean, it, it may be that, you know, in grassroots, if you, if, to Brian's question, if he has got 15, he's kind of obligated, regardless of level, to play equally. Yeah, and I think obviously yeah. once you step up, you play in a bigger format as well, aren't you? Yeah. I mean, the distance is a bigger, it's more physical, et cetera. Yeah. So, again, look at the, the Premier League now, you're allowed five substitutes. Well, you're playing with 16, yeah, yeah, it, players. It, I mean, exactly. It's, it's, it's the, 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 the football. I mean, yeah. if you told me when, when I was a young player that, Football it wouldn't be eleven v eleven. It's not eleven. Again, it's again, twenty. We're twisting there on ideology as well, yeah. isn't it? Where again, we, we talked about it last night. Where actually, then if you talk about the rotation of positions, mm. we're talking about mm. like a global development program for players over a period of time. So if we're saying from eight to sixteen, is where where you're you're learning all those elements. There's the same yeah. skill sets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, it yeah, builds yeah. up if you play bigger format. Yeah, yeah. Actually, having a right foot play played on the left and a left foot play played on the right, and a midfielder playing as a centre back and a centre back playing as a midfielder and a winger playing as a full back, yeah. you're getting to learn actually who you're going to come up against. Mm. Who, who knows what what uh, position they're going to end up in? I could give you many examples as players who we thought was was one position that ends up playing another, like an outfield player becoming a, an England goalkeeper. You know that we, we just don't know, but I think that there's. We've got to understand the development journey. It's not just about pigeonholing players. You know, you're, you're big, so you're going to play centre back. You're left footed, so you've got a. Generally, I remember when I, you know, like you sure you remember the same. You were pigeonholed a little bit. And I think now, you know, again, knowledge is power, isn't it? And it's easy to do that. But if the coaches want to give the kids the best experience, they need to to be to be playing as much as each other, but also to be to be challenged and given the. The the, um, the opportunity to to find where they fit. Yeah, I think yeah. that's the, I think that's, a, that's that's really important. And again, with your partner clubs, but generally people who are interested in Kerber, because I think uh, I can't think it's twenty or uh, twenty seven years ago, when when whenever we made a, um, a, a video in those days, a video was called a um, uh, new era. That's what yeah. it's called. And Charlie and I um, uh, in the in the marketing. Um, our blurb was our pitch was um, that Kerber teaches every player, regardless of the position, the same skill sets. So to Scotty's point, where if you're big, you're in goal, or you're centre high, you know, middle, central, forward, or a, a, a strike, a big striker. Um, we actually try to all those years ago to try to challenge that to saying that Kerber has a curriculum that can develop players regardless of size, regardless of position, including the goalkeeper. Um, with the same skill sets because we've developed over these 40 years a curriculum to do so rather than just say, look, that's what should happen. Because I think that's one, the beauty is for me anyway, I'm biased, but for Kerber, in Kerber is that we've got these ideas that many people agree. The difference is we've actually built a curriculum and a method over the years to actually back up our ideas. It's like a 40-year yeah, yeah, research yeah. project, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's been developed mm -hmm. to it trial and error and through lots of different sure. situations through then being underpinned by science now in uh, you know in, in, in the years building up to where we are now mm. so um that's a really good recap guys and, and i think we've talked about sort of the benefit of of being curve a partner club we've talked about some of the issues about developing technical players particularly at the back we want to play out um now i think we should get on to the topic which has been the most common post on our on our social media 
around behavior. Uh, so that's behavior of players. And the first question comes from Casey uh, in America. Uh, she's a high school girls team coach. And she's looking for ideas to help uh, increase team bonding within the team. So he said, she said that um, her players often bicker and, and there's uh, some infighting. So have you got ideas, some general tips on practices, drills or games that can increase, I guess, fun, but also sort of the support of one another? Well, again, you know, what we've got to recognise is that it's a team sport uh, first and foremost. And I think that, I guess, generally what, you know, what will happen with, um, you know, within teams is actually you need to have that camaraderie and sort of, you know, back in your, your, your mates up really when, when things go wrong. So I think that, if I, if I look at that situation, I think that really the coach, um, you know, has to provide the environment where, where that's the, I guess, the first and foremost um, element is that we look after each other. Yeah. Um, in terms of sort of, I guess, drill, drills and games, it's a, it's a tricky one, isn't it? I think, I, think, I think with that, it's actually, once you become, it's, I guess it's maybe fostering the friendships, I think. Through fun. I, I, I think, would I you think so in the film? And maybe not necessarily, um, you know, linked to football training, maybe those outside of football activities, you know, getting them um, socialising together, maybe, you know, like football, if I, if I think about it, like a lot of my good friends with people that I met playing football, I think sometimes this gets yeah. maybe overlooked at the social element of it. You know, mo most kids are never going to play professional football and actually some environments that kids play in, there's a big dropout, uh, especially in our country at certain age groups of kids just not wanting to play football because they don't enjoy it. Yeah which is absolutely criminal, isn't it? Because I think, it, again, personally, you'll be the same. The experiences that football has given me, friendships, all those different things, um, it's, it's really important that the coach provides the players with the, the environment to, to develop that social side. So I think, yeah, like, you know, that teamwork, team bonding, I think, I think possibly outside of training um, would further strengthen the, the bond of the group. It's very common in professional football, isn't it, where maybe the results are down and they'll go out paintballing or yeah, or you'll, you'll have the chips. So I think I think that that sort of um, yeah, developing the camaraderie maybe in 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 other ways outside of the football is is really crucial actually. That's interesting. And Paul on Facebook also had a slightly related question. I'll throw this one over yeah. to you, Alpha Bout. Um, he works with the under thirteen boys team. Mm. And I guess the boys are just entering the teenage years and they're going through, you know, all the hormonal changes, the growth changes, the attitude changes, players wanting to sort of assert their own but characters and, and, you know, they're changing at that age group. Yeah. And sometimes it can get into negative territory, whether they're, you know, again, um, bickering in the team, saying players are rubbish, et cetera. Yeah. How, do you, um, how do you approach that? Is there some advice that you'd have to help um, sort of improve the behaviour and attitude of players. Yeah, so, um, so in Diploma 2 that we did yesterday, um, we were talking about, uh, I did a podcast with Arsene Wenger, and uh, Ars uh, really we were talking about the, um, a topic which I'm really interested in, and Dr. Baines also uh, trying to help me, educate me in this, and it's called emotional, emotional intelligence. So what's emotional intelligence? It means that um, the coach... Uh, is able to articulate, communicate to the players certain behaviours that are acceptable or not acceptable. Because um, one of the things, and relating to Scotty's answer, is that often it's just one or two kids that are disruptive. And those one or two kids spoil it for the other kids, right? That's really interesting. Yeah. Because Daryl on Facebook, again, he yeah. brings this up. He says a question related to, to discipline. How do you solve the following issue? Every training session, there's one fight with one kid. Yeah. It sets a yeah. bad behavior at another kid. The, and that's such a code. The code trust to, to, to be the, the leader. The head um, monster, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I don't think there's yeah. any way of getting away from it. So, yeah. Other yeah. players have ownership, etc. They should police themselves. Mm -hmm. which, which, look, can happen over, over time. And that's why I guess you build in towards that we're talking about kids, you know, here in some, some instances. So I think that the code has to practice what they preach. You know, if we if we we're, we're talking about you know looking after each other and not shouting when yeah. someone makes a mistake, and then the coach is shouting at the ref when the ref makes a mistake, mm. what you're telling the kids in training, you're not doing so. Yes, yeah. so, and, so, and, they, and, they, and they and also too that let's take about this thing about let's say a kid is a good kid, but he uh, he has uh, sort of s some issues. He's overactive, you know, and um, 
or, or it just doesn't have discipline. And that one or two kids is spoiling it for the other kids. So, um, as you say, it's a team game. You're a coach. You're that. You're the adult. Um, there's certain behaviors, uh, certain rules. So, what do you do? So, uh, first of all, you speak to them. Um, secondly, uh, if they could continue, you ask them to sit out. Um, and you know, first of all, ten minutes, then twenty minutes. Um, and so you go through a process, I guess, right? Not sort of banning them immediately. I'm not saying or throwing them out immediately, but but a, but a process. First of all, speak. Then you've got to sit down for ten minutes in the you know you sit out twenty minutes. Uh, maybe finally you sit out the whole half. Um, and if they don't learn, I think it's a conversation with the parents. Well, I think I think we've got yeah. to find the root of the problem as well because there could be many. Reasons. But that's what I'm saying. The parents are the ones yeah, that, that will know. Uh, yeah, could be yeah, many yeah. reasons for this yeah. problem. Like yeah. those two kids could go to school together, as an example. There could be an underlying. It's nothing to do with mm-hmm. a football session. There's something going on there. It could be one of the kids. There's something going on at home. You know, as coaches, we we, we play many different roles: the, the social worker, the friend, the coach, the taskmaster. There's many, many roles. Mm-hmm. So I think that you know, before we we we, we jump in. And then we have to fully understand the, the background of the situation. Exactly. And that comes back from your questioning techniques. Like Alf said, it, it's 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 getting the information from from the kid. It's getting the information from the grown-up that the kid might not disclose to you and vice versa. Um, then, of course, it's having that process in place, isn't it? Which, which probably links to the club code of conduct. There's, there, there has to be, you know, that has to be in place from a club perspective of how you deal with that situation. So it's all done correctly. Well, I think, you know, in the podcast, Arsenal made a good point. He said the coach has got to be fair. Um, and, I, of course, he's talking about first-team players, et cetera. But, 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 but what I got from it was what, what we're talking about now is that if I have a, a rule for, for one player, that rule has to be for the other players, yes, and and the kids soon see if there's favoritism, don't they? You know, yeah. you, they soon they they're, they're smart, even though young ones they they, they see well, uh, he does it or she does it, but I can't do it. I, I had an example of this in our new eleven boys team, mm. arguably our best player. Mm. Um, sort of, it felt like a bit of a test actually, behavioural test for me. Yeah, yeah. He was playing up, didn't want to do what we were by trying to coach. You know, thought it was boring. And I don't know if this was the right sort of reaction from him, but I immediately identified the page and said, that's not going to stand mm. in this session. Mm. And I called out the best the best player in the team. Mm. And I hope it set a standard or um, sent a message to the rest of the team. If I'm being fair in that way that you yeah. described, yeah. to our best players, yes. then everyone else knows what they expect. It's, it's being firm and fair. Yeah. Yeah. I think if you... Or consistent too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, not in charge. If you've got those three things, yeah, and, yeah. And then it, that's the environment you're creating. Mm-hmm. And actually, it's action a consequence. Isn't that? Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, kids will push the boundaries. Uh, but, but again, it goes back to the coach as the leader of the, you know, the, the group and the environment to, to, to make sure that, like you said, it's fair, it's consistent. Yeah. And it's firm. Um, that's, that's how I would approach it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. So, so we talked a little bit about the sort of negative side. There's a question that's coming on Facebook as well about the positive side. So how do you reward players for good behavior, good performances, progress, etc.? So I'll give you a, a question first. Have you got ideas on, uh, this is particularly relating to the set, next session maybe that yeah. you do. Would you do a fun tournament? Would you do a competition? How would you Yeah, I think, I think there's some different uh, ways you could do this. Maybe they become the captain in the next match as an example, the kids. You know, they love that mm. feeling of being mm. the captain and mm. the leader of the team. Good idea. You know, you could have a you know a special football as an example that they can keep for the week. You know, to practice their skills at home. Um, there could be um, they choose the um, you know the the game or the last drill for the the last part of training. So whatever they want to do, you mm. know. So I guess a lot of it comes back to like responsibility and um, like I said, having uh, having control over things that they might not have control over. So you, you can make yourself the captain if you if you do X, Y, and Z. And, you know, you can be in charge of what we do in training. You can become the captain. Um, I think I think they're quite powerful. Yeah, right? so I think, I think you know, you reward something and they see that if they do it, they reward yeah. it. I mean, don't you do... Um, I was watching because Jesse, my grandson, got player of the week, the player of the year, player of the minute. I'm not sure... 
<laughs> they get they get yeah, something. There's various yeah, yeah. Mm. and we also have a parents battle of match coaches. Oh, yeah, exactly, exactly, match, exactly. And we try and spread it out. Yeah. Um, the question was actually asked by Danny, who's a U8 coach, and his idea was instead of kind of serious in the next yeah, session, yeah. the players could suggest maybe what they wanted to do. He yeah. said they all want to do bulldogs. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you're right. Yeah. Hey, you think there's ever a you know is there is there a fun game? Our players at the U11 uh, age group like the two v two tournaments that we do at the end of the season mm-hmm. or end of the term. Sorry, that we are. That's great. I did. So uh, yeah, and then you name you know yeah. your art team that you're in. Whatever you have a little mm-hmm. mini world well card. Yeah. Is there any other ideas that you have around rewarding the whole team for good behaviour and progress? We yeah. can buy them. Uh, uh, no oh, tree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think no, I, was, I think what's a good one as well is actually maybe that you know whoever wins that player of the week that week gets to choose the player of the week next week and they're allowed to choose themselves as well i, I think that that's you know like if they genuinely i think it's really well. interesting uh, I, I, is. I, wonder, I, I wonder if that, how many would pick themselves. Just, every week yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I bet but my point is i bet not many would no i don't i don't, I don't think so but i think it gets it gets kids mm. you know really thinking about things that again it, it it's you know the more responsibility we can give the kids, yeah, really. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, the, I guess the natural reaction is for coach to, to do it all the time. Sure. Um, was actually, I think that that's another it's great good message, it's another great, great opportunity to pass it over to, to the kids. And, and I guess as as youth coaches, we're all trying to uh, help improve life skills as well. How do we mm. impact the kids positively from yeah. a social perspective, and and ingrain in them or help them with key life skills that will well, help clear them. enough all the equipment. <laughs> yeah. Just, just how you need to tidy your bedroom. Do it exactly, exactly. <laughs> but, but even stuff like that, that yeah. like the, the, the players should be tidying the equipment. Yeah, or, yeah. You, you know, it, it shouldn't be. You know, coaches there on their own. That that's not how it works. Again, it goes back to the environment. I, it's 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 uh, just a little story about that again. When um uh, um, I did another podcast with uh, Wenger, Arsene Wenger, and he, I was asking Arsene who. Who was the players? You know, all the great players he's had that that he admired, and of course he admired one. But he picked Dennis Burkamp above all, and he was saying, with Dennis, you know, it's always the first, always last, always picking things up. Well, always, t- you know, that. And um, I don't know if you see that in youth football. Um, um, I, I, when I watch my grandkids, I sometimes see, you know, thankfully uh, that, that that they do, they go and pick up the colours yeah. without the coach telling them. Yeah, they, they go and move the goals. Yeah. They, I'm showing you the end of the thing. So I think that whole, that you know, that more um, uh, that football's more than a game. And I think in Curva, when when I, it's a long time ago, but Charlie, the first uh, mission statement we made in 1984, which is almost 40 years ago, when Charlie and I sat in his kitchen table in Cincinnati, and we we, we were thinking about, well, we've got we've got this idea, uh, we're going to call it Curva, um, but w- what's our mission statement? And and the first thing was to try to use the game. To improve uh, well-being, uh, mental and physical well-being. So it was. We didn't go straight to the technical part. A lot of people misunderstand because we're a technical program. But but I, I, t- as if it was yesterday, I remember that the first thing we came is how can we use football to improve the mental and physical uh, uh, well-being of the, of the kid. Well, Chris, yeah. Chris on Facebook again has asked this question about resilience. I mean, mm. obviously. That's a key opportunity using yeah. football to teach that, and mm. we all go through losses, etc., in, in games, and that mm. can help kids tremendously. Mm. So the question from Chris is, um, how do we respond to a tough defeat? How, what do I say to my players? What do I do in the next training session mm. when we get beaten by you know significant margin? Scott, any ideas? I, I think going back to to what I sort of covered earlier, I think you just need different ways to gauge success. Well, we, we cannot be defined by the result. You just can't. That can't define that 90 minutes or 60 minutes. Like I said, you play really well and lose and play really badly and win. You know, whatever that is to you. Yeah, so I think that if you've got personal targets and team targets, so it talks about how many times can we win the ball back within five seconds, which is probably really a small group target, which can be shared by the pitch. That can be broken down also into individual targets. So it could be for your winger, how many times can I beat my opponent one v one in the game? You know, so actually, you, you know, you, you could lose by heavy defeat. How many shots have you had? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That player's target for that game was yeah. to, to to win re re one v ones. So you've actually got sub targets to to bring a positive out of it. Um, 
But again, I think it, it's bringing training to life, isn't it? The way that I would 100% approach this is using, you know, what you work on in training has to be brought to life in the game at the weekend. There can't be a disconnect. Sure. And then I think if you then got this other way of gauging success, um, you, you know, I think that you've got some different ways to, you know, to, to evaluate after the match. Of course, no one goes into the game wanting to lose from a score point of view. and Everyone wants to win, but that's not possible all the time. Mm. So actually, if we've got if we've got multiple ways um, as a team, as a unit, as an individual, um, you know, I think we've we've got multiple strategies then, haven't we? That and again, going back to what I said, the parents need to understand yeah. the process. But it's okay also to have yeah, setbacks. It, it, this okay has to be communicated. Yeah. This, this is what we're. You know, this is a long game. If we're we're gonna we're gonna try and play out from the back today, as an example, if we're gonna play. We're gonna be risky. We 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 might lose. Three, four, five, six goals doing this. The only way we're going to get good at it when it matters later on um, is by making loads of mistakes. Now, it's easy for us to sit here and say that, but but ultimately, unless you make loads of mistakes, you're not going to you're not going to improve. Yeah, you know? yeah. I asked uh, uh, Peter Bain, my my, my friend, who's a top neurologist. Uh, I said, Pete, how how do you square? How do you explain losing because it hurts, right? How 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 would up you explain? Losing to a parent or a kid, you know, that it's it's hurtful, and I, I, I very um, absolutely gave me the, in my opinion, the right answer. He says by saying that um, you re- can regard can not definitely uh, will can regard losing as a motivation. Um, so, in other words, and Arsenal said that in the emotional re- re- resistance uh, resilience, excuse me. You, we were we were talking about why do so few kids make top pros, and it wasn't to do with the skill or the tactics and or the physicality. It was to do with this what he was describing as as mental uh, uh, resilience, and that meant that you accepted defeat in a way that it motivated you. Or when you were dropped, and he he, um, he raised that question. He said, "Look, I've, I have to drop." leave international players on the bench and the best ones the ones that come back are the ones that accept it and then in training day you see them work harder <laughs> in other words losing as a motivational tool yeah. and now is that a fact um I, I don't know but but it makes sense if, like if i'm the grandparent or father uh, and somebody says to me well look it's horrible we lost but when we lose that means that some of our players might try harder next try, might practice more. It depends who, who it is. It depends the the environment and the yeah, thing as well. Does and the individual. Some 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 kids will react to a certain approach, and some won't. Um, you know, it goes back to that in, individualized approach. Uh, you've got to know your players, and if you know your players, then you know how to deal. But it could be there's different. Yeah, you know, be. this 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 other question that comes up all the time, especially in the professional game is the, the the stats of conversion you know whether it's in spain or germany and it's, it's the same you know less than one percent of the boys or girls let's, let's talk about boys at the moment I'm, uh, the girls game is building but not the same uh, in the pro game and it's less than one percent that join a club at 12 will play for the first team um that's or any professional of, or, the, the, or, no 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 they or go down their own. 30 or 40 percent will go down to low leagues etc. i'm talking about the top league so the the bundesliga the, the league etc so you see these stats and and the part and we, we did a, a podcast with royal hodgson and we were talking a, a, again well what what is it so i think we all we agreed that it's not the skill because you wouldn't be at a pro club unless you had skill it's not the tactics because you've got professional coaches at uh, pro clubs. The physicality, okay, between 12 and 16, it changes, but you kind of know, you know, you've got big kids and small kids and quick kids and the physicality is there and you can improve it. So there's only one one difference and that's the mental side. And and in Curver, I think we're looking harder and harder at that to, to actually, um, why are we looking at it? Because, for example, with Scottish programs, with partner clubs, if we come to a conclusion, it'll affect the way we design drills. It'll affect the way we design session plans. It'll affect the way we talk to parents. Um, and so uh, Dr. Bain in the last 15 years has been a really, uh, uh, when, when Scotty says, curve is supported by science. Well, we've got one of the world's great scientists looking at the curve method, curve curriculum, and 
and also then backing up the, if you like, the missing link of why kids are successful or they're not. Now, it could be other things. It could be social. I mean, we don't know what happens. Oh, um, yeah, Scotty, that the players at pro clubs, they go out at four o'clock. We don't know what's going going on at the house, right? Um, so, the, the, absolutely, that's a factor. Um, uh, I remember Roy saying that he thought 30% was luck, just pure luck. You know, you play well at the right time and you the, the and you coach says, hey, right? you, hey, yeah. but, but, but then that left the 70%, which, which Dr. Bain and Arsenal were, were, were uh, are convinced, that, as I am now, that there is that mental component and w let's call it um, uh, emotional intelligence. Well, we, uh, for those of you that are interested in that Dr. Bain podcast episode, please please go on a YouTube channel or Spotify uh, channel and you'll find it. It's been, uh, to date, a really popular episode for us. And we're going to do a part two uh, next month as well with Dr. Bain. So, And it will be all around emotional intelligence. And I think it's a, an interesting topic for us all. Uh, it's obviously got application in football terms, but also in, you know, if you've got kids, that it obviously transfers to, to how you're trying to help your kids as well. So, yes. I think the other podcast that I'd recommend, Jim, for our, um, to the people who are interested in Kerber or for youth football is the one with uh, Roy Hodgson. Um, now, of course, Roy is uh, uh, teaching, uh, sorry, Roy, Roy's coaching the senior level. But but he, he has been around, like I've, I've known him almost 50 years. So um, his um, understanding of what it takes to be an exceptional player yeah, he's got a lot of really good insights and um, of course we concentrate on grassroots etc but in, in grassroots whatever you want your kid to be as best as they could be I think Scott described that before yeah. to fulfill that potential and and I think that podcast with Roy was also to me, for me anyway quite enlightening on well what is it that they need to do yes you know well let, let's uh, no it's, that's good stuff and let, let's do two more questions guys before we yeah. wrap up uh, the, the next one from Brian on Facebook, again, it's uh, slightly related to the topic of resilience. He has a relatively relatively small U12 boys team, physically small. And then now, you know, that's the age group where you're beginning to see some bigger kids now playing. And he said they regularly get kind of out-muscled and out-physical, what you call that. But, you know, the physical part is a difference in their games. And it's mainly that they're not seeing results. Sure. Um Scott, is this is this going back again to your point about can we quantify development in different terms rather than just the score sheet, or is there a, a, an attitude or, or set of practices or drills that you could give smaller players that could help them compete with with physically bigger players? I think possibly Japan's a good example of this, Alf, isn't it? Where you know seeing sort of I guess where physicality side is is maybe not the number one attribute but speed and skill and you know hard work um you, you know there's a factor you know we don't be outworked number one so again you can set that tone in training but again i think if you look at smaller players always have to find a different way you know mm -hmm. we've, we've seen that over the years if you look at uh, zabi as an example not yeah. necessarily the, the quickest or, or biggest but he his first touch was so good his game understanding was was so good his first touch was absolutely impeccable so we always had time so i guess there's there's always a way but again it's it's a it's a long process isn't it and, and again like if that's the case and you're coming up against bigger players um week in week out in those age groups you, you're probably going to suffer quite a lot of defeats yes. um so again i guess it's it's the education of you know the players the, the parents etc and and trying to find a you know a, a solution to to the problem really like i said i think japan's a really yeah, good so, example yes yeah, so, i mean that's a really good uh it, it is because generally japanese are smaller um but so uh, to the question uh, from what was his name john uh, from, from john's question so um w w one one thing uh that when you've got smaller players uh, against big, bigger physical players um if you're able to keep possession you can control the game but it's difficult to keep possession you know, maybe let's say the ground's muddy or the players haven't got the skills. So, but but possession is one way that you can, the players can be really, you know, much bigger and stronger than you. But as long as you've got the ball, you control the game. Um, and so the other thing is that um, the 
understanding of space because John's team now are playing 11 v 11. They're playing in a bigger field. Um, so space can be the equalizer. If you're in the right space or you have space, and even if the player is very big and you've got the space to play, it, again, it's related to possession. You can keep possession. You can two touch the ball, three touch the ball. If you've got no space, if they're right on top of you, you can't. And they're physical. They'll, they'll, they'll just uh, take you out. So the understanding and working on space, when to go into space, when to close space. So my team's got the ball, we make space. They've got the ball, we close space. And, you know, John should just keep uh, in training, working on just that, that, that statement to the kids. Yeah. And then by possession, they'll control the game. Um, but that knowledge of space is absolutely important. And my, 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 just if I can uh, talk about the physical size, because this has come up. Um, I, I've got a very good friend, David Connolly. David played for uh, um, uh, Southampton. He played for Ireland. Um, he's got two uh, boys uh, 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 at school, one with Jesse, your son. And so David was saying, well, it's all about physicality, you know, between 12 and 16 when you're running a team, go and recruit the biggest guy, recruit a guy uh, the size of Scott. He wasn't and, saying that you should do that. No, no, no. He was saying, he was saying, oh, no, no, no. David is absolutely a, a, a fantastic coach and, and he's not saying that should happen. But what he's saying is that a lot of teams recruit big kids and they win games. But of course, there's 10 other kids that are not developing. So... Um, you know, Scotty and I were doing a Diploma 2 course where, when our, our whole case, and on Saturday we are at Leicester City, I think, right, Scotty, I'm doing that. Our whole case is that possession, if you can play a possession style, you will practice the core skills and make your match day as an extension of training. So to David's point, and I think he's absolutely right, and all the games I've seen with my grandkids, you've got one kid, especially when they're 12, 13, or, or even younger, who scores five goals because he's just so big, so strong. And so his point was, well, we've got to then combat that. And my point is, well, n no, for one kid, I still try to play possession because I've got, uh, when they're playing 11 11, 10 other kids. So although this kid might be my match winner, I don't want to play for him or her. I want to him or her to play for the other 10. I think that is a lot of, I think you, I don't know if you've seen it in your partner clubs, this recruitment of big players. And they, they just, you just see one or two. Yes. You'll, you'll see one kid is double the size of another kid. He's going to score at will, right? And, so and going down and, the right way for your players as well, yeah. there, isn't it? So going back to the original question, it's actually the coach could have their idea on how they want the game to be played, right. but you need to focus on the strength of the players. Mm. So if he's asking his team that are physically smaller to, to, to play in a way that is not going to get the best out of the situation, their attributes, mm. then he really needs to... Yeah, he wouldn't, I mean, he wouldn't pump... Uh, no, he exactly. wouldn't do long balls. But he, corner but, but kicks he might and, believe yeah. in that. Yeah. And that yeah. yeah. he, he just yeah. tries to persevere with this way to do it because that's what he thinks is best. Yeah. Whereas actually, it's looking at you know the attributes of your players and finding a way for them yeah. to get success. Yeah. As Al said... You know, if, if if there is a physical issue, then, then of course, like the ball travels faster than any player is, yeah. for example. Yeah. And if we can think quicker and react quicker. Yeah. Again, the Spanish team, you know, if you look at some of the examples, yeah. it's the yeah. Spanish team, yeah. the Barcelona team. Or, or the, like you said, Joe, this is Japanese. Yeah, the I mean, Japanese, we've got yeah. five, five curva kids in the Jap current Japanese national team. Yeah. They're all small, much smaller than you. Yeah. And and so, you know, that, that, but John's got what he's got. He's got small players. He's got that. So he's got, like Scotty says, he's, he's got, got to, he's got to work with that, yeah, right? So and the good. only thing I can think of is trying to keep possession with two touch football by understanding space. Okay. So uh, fascinating conversation, Scott. Thanks a lot. The the next yeah. question is, and the last question is more of a teaser for the next uh, episode that we're going to do around creating and converting goal scoring mm. yeah, goals. So how do we score? How do we create more goals? And we're talking to a couple of experts that will be help us with that topic. Generally, can you give a couple of tips? I'll throw this one over to you, Al, hmm. on grassroots coaches, how they can help create and score more goals. Okay, so uh, with this one, this is very simplistic. Just shoot more. You right, know, practice. Uh, well, no, I mean, just in the game, you know, people, we, 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 we're not scoring goals. 
Say, yeah, I know why, because you're shooting. I think sometimes yeah. young players are quite afraid to take that responsibility. Uh, yeah. Maybe their players moan at them, maybe the coach doesn't want exactly. them to do it, etc. So, yeah. What I'm saying is, simplistically, um, is just tell them to shoot more. Okay. The other thing is a lot of goals are scored when, say, I shoot and it hits Scotty and it bounces off and then you're there. But what happens with younger kids or, or grassroots kids, especially, is they watch. They're spectators, right? So they'll see the shot and the rest of the guys are just watching. Whereas if they actually moved in, I'm sure they'd pick up, I don't know how many, but they'd pick up more chances, right? So shoot, follow up. On a more sophisticated and future um, uh, uh, program that we're working on, it's called um, The Winning Zone, uh, which Charlie and I have sort of been working on for six months. It's, it's a program, and hopefully it'll be a, a new diploma course we'll do. Um, in the, it's a program... So what we're basically saying is that 99% of goals are scored in the, in the last third, 30 meters from goal, at all levels, grassroots, World Cup level. And um, in Kerba, what we're trying to do in that last 30 meters, which we call the winning zone, is to devise rules and games that, that, that have two parts, creating the goal chance individually and in small groups, and then converting the goal chances. So... Uh, it's, a, it's a really exciting project, and we're hoping to convert it into uh, our next diploma yes. course. But it'll certainly be the topic of, of the uh, podcast. And we'll discuss it more in, in the next Absolutely. pod. Got anything to add yeah, to that? Yeah, if I look at it from a session planning point of view, because, of course, it's going to come down to practice. We don't work on it a lot in training, and we expect in the games to teach this. So I, I don't really think that's the case. So it's actually looking at how much you spend in your mm -hmm. training sessions that involve a goal and shooting. So actually, I think, when you look at what kids want to do, the two big things they enjoy most are playing games and scoring goals. So as much as you can integrate goals into your training sessions, again, with the little ones, even the target goals were teaching accuracy. Yeah. You know, look at look at a lot of Messi's finishes as an example. It's yeah. about accuracy and placement. But I think that the practice um, is the foundation, is it? it's the key. So it's actually looking at your session planner and how much of your training can involve goals and shooting. I think almost every part of the session could integrate. And I think a lot of the curve like drill that. library has. Yeah, right. And, and, yeah. Yeah. It's something and the small goals, Scotty, I think you raise a really good point. Yeah. The small goals yeah. for, so, for accuracy. So for accuracy, yeah. and then it's yeah. looking at, you know, building up the, the knowledge of the different situations, again, through your session planning. So when we work on finishing with the partner, not as an mm. example, mm. we work on the different situations. So back to goal, towards goal, cutting into goal, going mm. across the goal. Mm. So again, it's creating those micro situations for the kids in training to then link, you know, into the game with the game target. So if we're working on that in training, this is what the focus yeah. is on the game. Mm -hmm. Um, to, to to sort of not work on it in training. I think one v one's another topic that's that's similar. So we don't work on and it part of our history. and a part of our history. Yeah, yeah, but but, but, but I mean this 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 thought process yeah. of like so we, we we don't work on it in training, but then magically we expect it to happen yeah. in the game. Yeah, like co confident needs competence mm -hmm. you're going to get competence through practice yeah through lots of practice yeah. you're going to get confident and ultimately finishing and 1v1 probably the two real pressure moments in the game where actually there is panic uh there is not a lot of time to think yeah. and so actually again having that and there's no space no exactly yeah. having that confidence yeah. on the ball having already been in those situations in training lots and lots of times i think that repetition I, I look at it, it's like the ball mastery is no different to finishing practice. It's through lots and lots and lots and lots of repetition of different movements, different actions, different situations. And then once you get into the game, you're more confident, you're more, more competent. Sure. Um, and, and then obviously once you start getting success in the game, that's when you've got, that's when you, mm. that's when you feel it and then you practice more. It becomes addictive, mm. isn't it? But I think the listeners should, um, you know, look out for this new program. It's called The Winning Zone. And uh, we hope to launch it in the next few months. Okay. Well, guys, thanks very much for, no for being with us today. Uh, listeners, thank you for being with us. And uh, please like and subscribe. And we'll see you on the next pod episode.